very much. Thank you, Frank. Um, thanks to the organisers for allowing us to talk. Um, thanks to the audience for having the energy to, uh, to make in the last section. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about a particular aspect of what we call computational information geometry, uh, and that's applying it to the computationally difficult task of inferencing mixture models. Uh, again, this is joint work with the same four, Kareem, Frank, and Paul. Um, and computational, computational information geometry is going to be the key idea. I'm going to be using the same high dimensional extended multinomial families as the proxy for the space of the distributions. So uh, that's exactly the same as before. And as I say, um, mixture modeling is going to be the Now, this is a conference on geometry and statistics, and we've seen a lot of fantastic stuff, some very difficult stuff. Um, we've actually missed one of the most important, one of the most beautiful parts of uh, geometry and statistics, and that's Lindsay's work on uh, mixture model geometry, which is always been historically separate from the information geometry that we've seen in Mara's life. Uh, but it's still incredibly powerful, it's very beautiful, but it's been developed completely separately. So I've been to many of those sort of conferences and no one ever talks about that. I go to mixture conferences and no one ever talks about information geometry. But it turns out that they are in fact very closely related and one of the things I'm going to do today is to show you uh, what the relationship is, at least in the discrete case, um, in the uh, uh, more continuous case, um, that's like so we're going to talk about that. Finding that link, in fact, gives us power both ways. We can use some of the tools of Lindsay, um, particularly his functional directional derivative, to enable you to know if you found the maximum light less than the mixture model. That's a beautiful tool, which should be, I think, more well known. Uh, but it also enables us to use tools of information geometry to extend the power of his techniques, because uh, there are differences, and with is this chance of exploiting them. Uh, I've been using polytope uh, approximations. This is a slightly different type of discretization than the Frank talked about. We're using Frank's discretization, then adding another layer of discretization on there. Uh, Chinese question about computational uh, efficiency, I think, is an excellent one, and it's something that's always in front of our minds in, in the examples I'm showing you here uh, where we've done things. These are kind of toy examples in some sense, they're very straightforward. We still actually managed to uh, push the limit, particularly in the second example, of what's being done by, by other people, so we're quite pleased with that. So, I'm a statistician, uh, and statisticians, of course, are very used to mixture models. We're a very broad audience here, and so let me just talk a little bit about what mixture models are. Uh, they're an extremely flexible class of models, uh, and when, when do we use them? Well, if some of the data is not observed, we use mixture models. If there's some hidden dependent structure, which we believe, maybe after talking to the scientists from building our model, we think, I know things aren't quite independent, there's some dependence there, we might try to use a mixture model. Or if there's some unexplained heterogeneity, so we come along thinking we understand everything, uh, we fit a model, and we don't quite get the, uh, the variance right, it's over dispersion. Think, oh, now what do we do? Well, we can use mixture models. They're of the form, as you can see, uh, either a convex combination of uh, probability map functions or an integral of density functions, where this is just a, uh, integrating over some parameter of theta. And for this talk, um, and indeed for Lindsay's work, F here is an exponential family, typically in your integrator of an exponential family. So, just to show you what a simple mixture model looks like, here's a mixture over three normals, where I'm mixing over uh, a mean, I'm keeping the, uh, the variances I'm allowed to change, um, so I'm mixing over three components, and what I'm going to just show you here, just for illustration, here is the mixing distribution, so there are three probabilities, so I can just write down two of them, so they can be somewhere inside the simplex, and this is the corresponding density function we're going to get. So as we move the mixing distribution, you can see even in this completely trivial example, we get very flexible families of distributions, multiple modes, uh, very complex things, looking things, so that's rather nice. It's nice to be flexible in statistics, and it's nasty to be flexible in statistics. Uh, and um, 
It means we can make models which fit data very complicated data very well, but it also means we can very easily overfit. It means inference for these problems is hard, and it's genuinely hard, and this is still a, a very open, difficult problem. Lots of approaches, EM, MCMC, uh, all sorts of approaches, and we're taking this geometric approach. Why is it difficult? Well, one reason it's difficult, apart from overfitting, is that the likelihood function on mixtures doesn't behave anywhere nearly as nice as the likelihood function does in exponential families. Exponential families, everything's beautiful, life couldn't be better. Exponential families have this wonderful property that as you get more and more data, it all gets sucked into the sufficient statistics. You, 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 all the information sort of congregates in nice places and everything is beautiful. Life could not be nicer. That's why we love exponential families, whether they're finite dimensional or uh, Giovanni's infinite dimensional ones, they're wonderful. Mixtures do not have any of these properties. So, the likelihood function can have multiple modes. It can have singularities. It can have places where the likelihood goes to infinity. Maximum line estimate need not exist. Uh, the Hessian certainly need not exist. The Hess uh, second derivatives can don't need to be positive definite. So they're very potentially very very unpleasant. The underlying geometry is absolutely not the geometry of the manifold. It's much more of a simple a simplicial complex or a polytope or something like that. And so we have to be very careful using calculus and considering we're well, the differential geometries. That's a bit of a shame. What sort of questions are we interested in? Well, here's a mixture model. We might be interested in various things. We might be interested in learning about population objects, means of, or variances, or other properties of the underlying random variable, so population things. We might be interested in learning about the mixing distribution, how many clusters are, that type of problem. We may be interested in prediction, another problem. So each of these different questions uh, it, uh, gives a different appropriate approach. So let me give you two examples. Um, the first one, a simple data example. This is one of the data examples which is used uh, a lot in introductory uh, books on uh, mixture models, so we can use it as well. Um, you've got this is a question of count data, and everything I'm going to be doing today is on counts, and I'm going to keep everything discrete. So mostly I'll be looking at mixtures and binomials. Um, so the count concern the frequency of definite planted fetuses in laboratory animals, so you're, you're counting numbers. So zero maybe in one experiment, five in the next experiment, seven in the next experiment. Uh, because these are, this is a real experiment uh, and the animals were bred and they came from litters, there is potentially dependence between them. Animals from the same litter might behave in a similar way. So you can't think of the experiment as being completely independent, and so mixtures seem possible. And the paper, the original paper, made this statement: simple one-parameter binomial cross models generally provide poor fits to this type of binary data, so binary or count data. And they further go to say it's interesting to look in the neighbourhood of these models. That's their phrase, a neighbourhood of that model. And so that's one of the things that sort of struck our interest. Well, what does the neighbourhood of a model look like? Well, we've got these proxies for these spaces of uh, all possible models. That's a natural place to look for me, for neighbourhoods. So the, our proxy is the extended multinomial space, which Frank just described, and that's where we're going to look for our neighbourhood, and we're going to use, uh, I'll, I'll describe a little bit today, don't have too much time, uh, a new algorithm which seems to do a good job. Second example, completely different. This comes from graphical models. A very, very simple looking model with very complicated likelihood behavior. So this is the tripod model, uh, uh, Svenik and uh, Jim Smith. Um, so here's a simple graphical model. At each node, you've got a binary random variable, yes, no, on, off. There are four nodes, but one of them is hidden. If I knew the hidden node, the, each of these three nodes would have been independent. This is called the tripod model, but I don't see the hidden mode. So that still looks like a very, very simple model. H is unobserved. In fact, the likelihood structure for this is incredibly complex. Uh, the, there are multiple uh, local ma maxima. Uh, there are disconnected sets if you look at level sets. So MCMC has a problem moving around this space. Gradient flow things have a problem. EM is a local. Uh, method, so let me find a local mode. 
astonishingly simple model, very difficult inference, certainly a likelihood sense. So we can be looking a little bit at that, though I won't have time to do it full justice. So Frank's gone through all of these things, so let me just quickly go through. I'm going to, I'm going to be just looking at discrete models today. Um, the space of distributions is simplicial. Uh, there are boundaries because I am going to allow probabilities to be zero. That seems to be important in what we're doing. Um, we're looking at extending uh, multinomial models, this proxy of uh, space models, and we've got explicit information, uh, explicit information geometry. But Johnny's question, I think, is absolutely relevant. Always got to ask the question, even though I can write down a formula, can I actually compute the number at the end of it? I, th I think that is, is always important to keep in mind. Okay, so that's information geometry, that's extended exponential families. What's Lindsay's geometry? That's the thing I was singing the praises of. Um, it's been around now for quite a while. Um, and you're looking at the class of mixtures of typically exponential families. So what you're trying to do in uh, Lindsay's case is solve one of those inference problems I talked about. In this case, it's find the mixing distribution which maximizes the likelihood over all possible mixing distributions. And that sounds really, really hard because the space of all possible mixing distribution sounds like some really complicated space and how can I possibly find uh, a maximum order? That must be a nasty looking thing. In fact, it's not. It's a very nice looking thing. It's always a nice discrete distribution with support points that are observed, uh, data points, and you don't need to look at complicated spaces to find it. So um, this is called the non-parametric maximal line estimate of Q. This thing always exists and always has very nice properties. What Lindsay's insight was, was to choose the right geometry to do your searching. And it wasn't a complicated geometry. It was simply a finite dimensional uh, affine space um, and I'll show you what that is in a second, under which you can do very simple things. The difference between his geometry and the geometries we've been talking about all week is that his was a data dependent geometry. The data you observe determine the geometry you worked in, particularly its dimension. Um, that's something which we don't see in information geometry, but it's a very lovely idea. Also comes down to pointing, don't have the geometry more complex that you need to compute with. He has rather than tangent spaces in his geometry, there are tangent cones, asymptotic limits in this type of thing are mixed chi squared rather than chi squared, but they're still rather elegant. So what does he do? Um, he uh, computes, takes an affine space which is determined by the observed phase. Great insight. Let the data help you choose the geometry. Uh, it's always going to be finite dimensional because the data is always only a finite amount of data. Uh, what you do is you take the n star distinct likelihood values, so in discrete data, you obviously you often have repeated values that you see, and even in continuous things, if you ran, you might be continuous things. But you're always going to have a finite number of these. Yeah, you plot in Rn star, or in Rn star plus, you've got these little people who are always positive, uh, the curve determined by the likelihood, not the log likelihood, but the likelihood of the model you've got, which is an exponential model. So that guy is a curve sitting inside Rn. Well, it couldn't be simple, Joshua couldn't be simple with that, right? Nice and easy. And then you find the non-parametric maximum likelihood estimate by working in this space, because that's all you need when it comes to likelihood. There's nothing else. If all the other directions are essentially flat, um, and you maximize a concave function over a concave set. It's a nice, not, true, not, not completely trivial, but a reasonable optimization problem. So that's Lindsay's approach, and I'm going to show you a picture in a minute which shows you the relationship between his approach and our approach. Um, what we do, of course, is we embed in a non-data dependent uh, uh, geometry. We, uh, let's suppose this is a binomial, this, let's suppose this is multinomial, let's suppose this is a discrete distribution over k plus 1 categories, so our data is counts, n in all to nk, um, we're looking at models like that, so we embed in this simplex exactly as Frank said, and we're careful to have a lambda zeros as it matters. 
we embed our unmixed model, say not binomial, uh, except inside this, and then we look at its convex hull. And that will give all possible mixture models. So that convex hull sits inside this KN. But we don't necessarily have to look at this whole simplex. As Frank said, um, some of these counts might be zero. So there's a special face of this simplex, which we call the, the observed face, P, P for positive, uh, non-zero. And that space, um, as Frank said, um, the, light, the shape of the light here is exactly what we expect from sort of undergraduate statistics. It's a lovely, almost quadratic, everything is nice. It's in all the other directions that you get problems. And the relationship between Lindsay's work and our work is basically, Lindsay isn't quite just working in P, but he's working in something very closely related to P. So I won't get time to theorem, let me just quickly go through a picture. So for this picture, suppose we had three observations, so K was two, so that I had N0, N1, N2, and let's suppose I saw five, zero, and seven as my data. So in Lindsay's geometry, uh, there's just two distinct values, so he'd be working in R2. In our geometry, like we've got We'll be working in this two dimensional simplex here, um, just with the three probabilities, and the embedded binomial model inside our geometry. So, this is our simplex in, in R3. Here's our binomial model, and just to go through here and here. And here's the observed face, P. The maximum likelihood split in the whole simplex actually lies about there on, the, on an edge just up there, and these are the likelihood contours within the simplex, and of course that induces likelihood on the binomial model, and in this case, um, the, the way I've drawn the picture, the maximum likelihood here is well outside the convex hull, and so there won't be over dispersion, you may be sort of under dispersion. So there's no evidence in this particular case that there's, there's going to be any over dispersion. But you can still question whether some model of sensitivity analysis on a binomial model, I want to move that around a bit or extend it, change its dimension. Here's Lindsay's geometry, as I said, two uh, distinct values uh, for the likelihood, so uh, P embeds inside uh, R2, and this is possible likelihood, this is possible likelihood values you get by changing different theta from the binomial model. You can construct the likelihood in this bigger space. These are likelihood contours. What's the relationship between this picture and this picture? Well, you take that vertex, which is this vertex, you take that vertex, so the two vertices, all the vertices of the positive face, and you look at the vector space which includes those. So you've got to include zero. So here's zero. So basically, if you project this picture onto the xy plane, if you imagine the Z plane is going into the board, you get this picture. And that's the relationship between the two geometries. But this is exact information geometry in the Namara sense, admittedly on the extended exponential families, where this is Lindsay's geometry. So they really are very closely related. So the nice advantages of working on the larger space, there are some disadvantages and advantages. One of the advantages of the smaller space is computational. One of the advantages on the larger space is you can have search algorithms which are more flexible because they can they work around the bigger space, whereas search algorithms in Lindsay's has to work in his data restricted space. And sometimes you don't want to do that. Out of algorithms enable finite finessing of the label switching problem, which if anyone, those of you who know about which models is a, is a nuisance. Huge nuisance, but it's a nuisance, and we can get around that very easily. Um, Lindsay's geometry captures the mixture and the likelihood structure, but doesn't capture the full information geometry. Because if you think about it, if you have a geometry whose space is data dependent, um, and the dimension of it depends on the data you're seeing, it can't really capture the total sample space, because in the total sample space, I have a non-zero thing here. So, in Lindsay's geometry, 
uh, you don't get that nice, or more than nice, beautiful relationship between the sample space and the parameter space that we have from the Mahler's geometry. So there's some definite advantages working in the bigger space. And of course, as ever in life, working in both spaces at the same time, uh, doing not just one or the other, doing both, is a very nice thing to do. Go through this uh, a little bit quickly. Uh, uh, Frank alluded to this, so I'll, I'll just carry on with this a little bit. In our geometry, um, if you've got a, a generic exponential back number, so generic means here that you know, uh, one with the, 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 this isn't the theorem which works for all exponential boundaries, but it works for almost all exponential boundaries, uh, the convex hull is of the same dimension as the embedding simplex. That's all, always, always going to work due to the total positivity. So that would make you think that to explore a mixture model, you have to work in a very high dimension, because that's what the theorem says. In fact, that's not true. So Anaya, that's Kareem, one of the other co-workers and myself, uh, have this idea of local mixture model, which enable you to construct very good approximations to mixture models. They're not exact, but they cover an awful lot of applications, and they're very easy to work with inferentially. They have a lovely fiber binding structure, which enables you, and on the fibers, the likelihood has beautiful structure. So in general, likelihood of mixtures is complex, multimodal, singularities, horrible. But on the fibers of these local mixture models, everything's nice. There, uh, the likelihood is concave, not strictly concave, but concave. And so you can search on each fiber, and on each fiber you can find maximum, and you can just work across fibers. And so you get beautiful algorithms here, which work very nicely. So local mixture models have a lot of advantages over full mixture models. They're not the same, obviously, it's a smaller subset. For applications, they're often adequate. So, what's the relationship between these two things? Well, there's a very simple idea that if you've got a curve inside a simplex, if a portion of that curve is close to, if the, everything in that curve is close to a minus a lower dimensional minus one affine space then all mixtures of it are also going to be close to that low dimensional minus one affine space. Because mixing over minus one structures, this minus one structure is preserved. So the idea is simple, that you break up the curve into a polytope of small sections, each of which is very close to a minus one line segment. It won't be exactly a minus one segment to be very close to it, and then just do uh, polytope type geometry rather than for differential geometry. And that seems to work very well, and that's, I don't have time, that's the basis of the idea of the algorithm that we've got here. That's the, uh, the uh, data we had before. But I just want to go to the, uh, the second of the examples, the uh, tripod example just to show you how this idea of approximating spaces with uh, things which are minus one flat in an appropriate way can be quite powerful. As I said, in the, poly in the tripod example, we've got very complicated likelihood structures. This isn't the tripod example. This is a bipod example, because right? so I can't draw a tripod example picture, because the dimensions are a bit too high. So the bipod example, you have x and y, and you have a hidden node, but the same idea. If you see the hidden node, then these things are independent, everything's uh, uh, binary here, all length variables are binary. Um, but you don't see the hidden node, so you've got a mixture over two uh, observed things. The space for such a thing in our embedding space looks like this. So the embedding space is three dimensional. The surface you're seeing here is the two-dimensional space, which defines this model. 
and its convex hull will be the space of mixtures. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. This space is a ruled surface. So the way that Maple has drawn this, you can actually see the minus one straight lines which make it up, and that means you can exploit the ruling on the surface to describe the space very efficiently. So let's go to the tripod example. So we've got Z here now. You get the same story. You sit inside a simplex, in this case a seventh dimensional simplex. You have a, not a surface now, but a three dimensional object, but still ruled, strongly ruled. The rulings are minus one flat. Mixing over minus one things can preserves them. Right? That's the way the mixture geometry works. Your mixture doesn't move you outside a straight line, you can't do it, it's an affine combination. That means you can exploit the ruled structure of, the, of this thing, so that not at the full convex hull, but what we call the three hull, because you're only, you're only really uh, mixing over, uh, oh, sorry, two hull, because you're only mixing over two possible alternatives here for H. That two hull is seven dimensional, inside a seven dimensional simplex, but doesn't actually fill the simplex. There are holes. Rather strange. Now, what you expect? It's not a convex hull, it's a two hull. Those holes are what cause the likelihood to have local modes. It what, it what makes exploring, say, FCMC extremely difficult because you get stuck in the holes and can't get around and can't explore very well. But by realizing there's an underlying rule structure and using a polytope or drawing approximation, you can exploit that um, to your advantage. Okay, I think I finished.